a one-week whirlwind of dinners and speeches, meetings, toasts, and private conversations. We know very little about what took place at the meetings and social events during this week. No detailed minutes were kept. The best first-hand information we have about the Charlottetown Conference is a letter which George Brown wrote to his wife, Anne. Dear Anne, on our first evening in Charlottetown, the governor, Mr. Dundas, gave a large dinner party to as many of the delegates as he could conveniently receive, I being one. Not all of the Canadian delegates could attend this dinner party at Government House, the residence of Prince Edward Island's governor. There were just too many of them. The governor's table could not accommodate that many people, nor could the city. The search for rooms for the Canadian delegates in crowded Charlottetown had turned up empty. The Canadian delegation remained on board their steamship, the Queen Victoria, all except George Brown. I was the guest of Mr. Pope, the provincial secretary, during my stay on the island, and was very glad to get to bed that first night. On Friday, we met in conference, and Canada opened with her heavy guns. The heavy guns were John A. Macdonald and George Etienne Cartier. Macdonald was first to address the conference. He was easy in his manner, casual, convincing. Macdonald favored a strong federal government as a protection against external threats and as a means of preserving our own laws, our own institutions, our own freedoms, our own culture. Johnny Macdonald stood before the Charlottetown Conference and openly dared to dream a great dream of one country, one nation, from sea to sea. Cartier's politics, <coughs> his passion for a national union filled every world. Cartier defended the distinctive culture of French Canada. He was the living guarantee to all the delegates that local government would survive within a national union. And he too dared to dream a great dream of forming one of the greatest nations on the face of God's earth. This, dear Anne, occupied the time of the conference until the hour of adjournment at three. At four o'clock, at his home called Hard Garden, Mr. Pope gave us a grand déjeuner à la fourchette A magnificent luncheon of oysters, lobster, <coughs> champagne, and other island luxuries. This was the icebreaker. The delegates suddenly relaxed with one another. Their conversation was political yet casual. Our government set the tone for the remaining days of the Charlottetown Conference. There were political speeches by day. Alexander Gall addressed the issue of finances for Confederation. George Brown, the structure of government and the division of powers. Questions were asked and answered. Come evening, and there was dinner and table talk when objections were tempered, details refined. Brandy and quiet comfort made for easy conversation. As the Fathers of Confederation pressed their heads together to explain this and modify that. And then more days of speeches, more debates, followed by more luncheons, more dinner parties, more toasts, more handshakes, more political issues modified and agreed to. was the result of our eloquence or the goodness of our champagne, the tongues of the delegates wagged merrily.
The opportunity to socialize at Charlottetown was the opportunity for the delegates to get to know one another and the opportunity to replace doubt and mistrust with an overwhelming willingness to dream a great dream. No written resolutions came from the Charlottetown Conference. Nothing was signed. Written resolutions would come the following month on October the 10th, 1864, at the Quebec Conference. The final draft of the legislation took place at the London Conference in December 1866. At first, not all the provinces were in full agreement. Wealthy and independent Prince Edward Island did not find all the terms of confederation to its liking. Prince Edward Island delayed joining for a few years. On July 1st, 1867, the Dominion of Canada was officially declared. The British North America Act gave birth to a new nation, which eventually would reach from sea to sea to sea. <laughs> Canada began as an idea, a big idea, an idea which is rethinking itself every day, changing with the times and growing politically, culturally and spiritually. It was an idea which was conceived in this building, and this is why Province House is a national historic site. Touch the walls, and you touch the long ago. Walk the halls, and you step into the past. In this building, history surrounds you with a great dream of a great nation, which is peaceful and welcoming. A nation in which all people have the opportunity and the freedom to dream their own great dreams. Now, now that's worth celebrating. <laughs> they were celebrating an idea, a big an idea which had taken shape in Province House during the Charlottetown Conference. It was the idea of creating a new nation, Canada. 